excited to begin a new message series today entitled Believing Right and Doing Right. These are the lessons that Paul wrote to Titus. We're going to take a journey over the next few weeks through Paul's letter to Titus, and we're going to talk about chapter 1 today, and the title of today's message is, Is What I Believe True? Is What I Believe True? From Titus chapter 1. You know, we get frustrated when people try to make the Christian faith complex, with lots of Lots of things to know, lots of things to worry about, lots of do's and lots of don'ts and lots of shoulds and lots of shouldn'ts. And whenever it gets complex, we get a little frustrated, but there are times when we need to make it simple. We need to remember how simple is the gospel. Now, this tendency towards complexity is worldwide. In fact, I heard about a young pastor who went into his very first pastorate. He was fresh out of seminary. He wanted to impress the people of the congregation with how theologically astute he was. And so he, got, he went to the pulpit, this very young pastor, and in a deep stained glass voice said, This morning, my sermon title is An Ontological Presupposition for the Proof of the Existence of God. And then he did his very best to wax eloquent and try to impress the people with what he had learned in theology. Being a single young man, there was an older widow of the church who thought this might be a good time to invite the young pastor to lunch. So she invited him to her home for lunch and she fed him well. Knowing what people feed pastors, it was probably fried chicken. <laughs> And after a nice lunch and a dessert, when the coffee was poured, she took that time, the moment is ripe, she thought, to share a word of wisdom with her pastor. She said, Pastor, we are so grateful for you. We are so glad you are here and you came to serve our church. And I hope you're not offended if I make a slight suggestion. Next Sunday... When you preach, will you please talk to us about something that we know a little bit about? And she paused and she said, and, and maybe it would be good if you would talk to us about something that you know a little bit about too. <laughs> yeah, we get frustrated when we try to make our Christian faith complex. When Christianity is complex, the prospect of living a God-pleasing life seems unattainable. So the purpose of this series is to remind all of us as believers here at Hope Community Church that there's a great amount of joy and a great amount of satisfaction to be found from the simplicity of our Christian faith, understanding the principles that lead us to right living, believing right and doing right. So imagine as we get started today, imagine that you lived on an island cut off from the outside world. Now, about 10 days ago, we took our Hungarian friends, the Steiners. By the way, did you enjoy having them here? Wasn't that amazing? So we took our friends, the Steiners, to Mackinac Island, where motorized vehicles are prohibited. It's kind of a magical atmosphere, you know, as you walk between the distinct aromas of fudge and, uh, let's say, horse exhaust. Um, and yet, while we were on the island, we were not disconnected from the outside world. We had cell phones that worked. I'm sure TV and radio signals can be received on Mackinac Island just fine. But such was not the case for the early Christians living on the island of Crete. And that's where we find this letter catching up with young Titus, a protege of Paul. Now, the island of Crete is found in the Mediterranean Sea 
It's a part of Greece today. But in those days, the island uh, had a distinct population, a distinct culture, its own roads, its own cities, its own currency, and even its own government. And the Apostle Paul traveled there in his missionary journeys, and he established churches. He won people to Jesus, and he established churches. So today, I'm introducing you to Titus, who was serving there on the island of Crete. And Paul did not send him an email, but he sent him a letter that somehow found its way to him through the old shipping lanes, and it contains simple instructions that are really profound teachings for us today. And here's why it's relevant to us. Paul was an amazing leader. And a certain vacuum exists whenever a strong leader departs. It can devastate a movement. It can devastate an organization. It can devastate an institution. Think Steve Jobs, for example. Having been dependent on his or her skill, his or her style and personality, associates can sometimes flounder for direction and maybe even compete for control. Soon efficiency and vitality are lost and decline and demise soon follow and we could name many corporations in America that have followed that pattern. But this pattern is also repeated in churches. Great speakers and teachers, strong personalities, they gather a following and soon a church is flourishing. You know something about that here at Hope. Soon it's vital, alive, effective. Lives are being changed and people are being led to the kingdom. But then when the catalytic leader dies or leaves, with him or her goes the drive and the heart of an organization. And this is what happened to the Christians on the island of Crete. People flocked to hear Paul's teaching. Here he was, educated, articulate, motivated, filled with energy and the Holy Spirit, this man faithfully proclaimed the Word of God as an amazing beacon of the light of Christ who had a personal experience of seeing Jesus on the Damascus Road. Lives were changed and churches were begun as a result of his ministry. But Paul knew something. He knew that a church had to be built on Christ, not on a person. And he knew that eventually he would not be there to build, encourage, to discipline, and to teach. So he trained young pastors to assume leadership in the church after he was gone. And Titus was one of those, a Greek believer. Not not a Hebrew, not a Jewish young man, but a Greek believer, taught and nurtured by Paul He stood before the leaders of the church in Jerusalem as a living example that the ministry of Christ was for the Gentiles and not just for the Jews. He had become Paul's trusted traveling companion, one of his closest friends. And the scripture says that he became Paul's special ambassador, kind of like a troubleshooter. Isn't that amazing to realize that Titus was such a bright leader? that Paul relied on him as kind of a troubleshooter. And so here we find him in the island of Crete. And that's why we turn now to chapter 1, and we have the little, little longer than usual introduction to one of Paul's letters. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone. It's by the command of God, our Savior, that I've been entrusted with this work for him. I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith that we share. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior give you grace and peace. 
It's a long introduction to a letter, don't you say? But notice in verse 1, if you go back a slide, here the people are seeing the mission statement very clearly. You know, we live in a world where all of us who are pastors are being told, are, is the mission statement clear in your church? And the vision statement of describing how you're going to live out the mission. Well, here it is. To bring people to faith, to teach them to know the truth, and to show them how to live godly lives. I would say that spans the centuries and has great application for us right here today in the 21st century. To bring people to faith, to teach them to know the truth, and to show them how to live godly lives. Sometimes I wonder why we strain so much to come up with a mission statement when such clear statements are right there in the Scripture. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to launch in and just kind of help you to look at this remainder of the passage. There's about 12 more verses here to help you to understand some things that authenticate our faith. If, if what we believe is true, then people will say it's true because they look at our lives as the evidence of the truth. Does that make sense? That's why so many times you hear unbelievers say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. And I always respond, I know, I know, but there's always room for one more. Oh, I've just been given the great gift of tact, don't you think? Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is the evidence of our faith, is that people will hear the words that we say we believe, that Jesus is Christ, the Lord, the Son of the living God, and they see the evidence of Jesus in our lives. They see Jesus in our eyes. They hear Jesus in our words. They feel the ministry of Jesus in our hands and the compassion of Jesus through our hearts. And we live as Jesus people. So how do we know that what we believe is true? Well, let's talk about three things that authenticate our faith. And the first one is this, right teaching by godly teachers. You know, the Bible clearly teaches that there are to be spiritual leaders and teachers in every congregation. The Lord places them in our midst. The Lord places people in the church. Many people who are here today have told me their own testimony to say, the Lord led us to come here. Some of you have been here for a long time. Some of you I would call founders of this congregation. Some of you have come in the last few months and say to me, felt led by the Lord to be here. Well, the Bible leads, the Bible says that God leads teachers and elders into the church. The Bible says there are certain qualifications to be recognized for leadership in the body of Christ. We're going to read those in just a moment. But the Bible clearly says that leadership and authority are to be grounded in the Scripture and not left up to human opinion and speculation. We get a lot of opinions, don't we? We're drowning in opinions. If you're on Facebook, you're drowning in opinions. But the minister of God has to take up the Word of God and cling to it in the face of all temptation and all opposition, no matter what people may say. It's the Word that we preach. The minister of God is a minister of God, not called to be a minister of anyone else, not a minister of the state, not a minister of the denomination, and not a minister of one's own opinion. Therefore, this mission is to cling to the Word of God and to preach sound doctrine, to help people to dig in for themselves and to seek the Word. His measurement is not how good of a speaker he is, not how charismatic, not how appealing, not how corny, I mean, funny are his jokes. <laughs> but really, the measurement is are we hearing the Word of God proclaimed in our midst? And so the Apostle Paul said to Titus, look here at verse 5, I left you on the island of Crete so that you could complete our work there. See, they had been there together. But I left you so that you could complete our work and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. 
An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife, and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life, must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home and must love what is good, must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message that he was taught, and then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. Now, that's quite a job description, don't you think? And most any one of us would read it and say, how, how can I know that I, I, as, I live up to every aspect of that job description? And that's where grace comes in. Because we know that all of us are a work in progress. But speaking the word of God, being that faithful teacher that I was talking about, I saw yesterday morning over breakfast a tweet that came from a young friend of mine who is also a young pastor of a church in Kokomo, Indiana. And listen to this tweet. Advice to young pastors per 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you preach the whole Bible and the whole Christ the whole time, you will get sucker punched regularly from the right and from the left, no matter your context. Do it anyway. That's a strong word, isn't it? Well, you know, wholesome Bible teaching that echoes the words and the spirit of Jesus, listen, echoes the words and the spirit. Those go together. Teaching that echoes the words and the spirit of Jesus, that's the foundation of the church. You know what else it is? It's the hope of the world. I mean that. It's the hope of the world. The second thing that authenticates our faith as we look at these three things is right methods of studying Scripture. Do you know there's just no way around it? You cannot grow in Christ apart from reading the Word. Right methods of studying Scripture. I've Always had a problem as a pastor, and and I know I get my ego wounded, and you probably would too, but it's always been hard for me as a pastor when someone says, well, I'm leaving because I'm not being fed. You know what I want to say to them? Well, you know, when my children were young, they began to feed themselves. You know, a Christian has a responsibility to feed himself or herself. We have to become serious students of the Word. Many people are just looking for that little shot of adrenaline, almost like we're junkies of the Word. We're looking for a verse that we can hang on the refrigerator or post-it note for our computer or the dashboard of our car. But Bible study is a lot harder than you can imagine. I'm not against taking a verse or two from the Scripture and being inspired by it. There are many that inspire us a lot. Let me give you an example. Nearly anyone who's been a Christian for very long has has, um, interfaced with Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, a serious student would begin to say, what about buying a commentary and taking a look at the context of those words? To whom were the words originally addressed? Discover the principles that apply to our lives that transcend the words then and how they apply now. You know, my grandfather was a pastor, and um, there was a particular verse that I heard my grandfather talk about a lot when I was growing up. It was kind of almost like a life verse for him, especially if you heard his testimony of how he came to Christ and how the Lord called him to ministry. 
And here it is, as he used to say it, in the King James Version. Why don't you just say it aloud with me? Just read it with me. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, Grandpa would say that, but you know what bears it out? His life. My grandfather died in 1996, but I have in my possession his old tattered Bible with a leather cover that he would preach from. And I mean the edges on the leather are worn out and the pages, some of them are loose. And from time to time, I take that Bible off the shelf and I open it. And as I page through it, I sometimes wonder myself, does he have more of this underlined than not underlined? He would take his little ruler and his red pen and carefully underline. It's the word of God, you know. Not carelessly, but particularly underlined. Some little notes out in the margins of his Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And I can tell you that while he was a kind of a self-made preacher man, who became a pastor in his 40s, he was a student of the Word. And his life bore it out. How do I know what he believed was true? I saw it in his life. So we have to develop ourselves by developing a Bible reading program, being consistent in prayer, looking for resources that will help us to grow spiritually and actually to feed ourselves. Now there's a third thing that I think authenticates our faith, and that is living right as a person of integrity. Living right as persons of integrity. Years ago, I heard a definition of integrity that has always stuck with me. It's my favorite definition of integrity because it's simple. And I like simple things that are easy to remember, and listen to this. If it looks like mahogany on the outside, it ought to be mahogany all the way through. Now that says a lot to us in this day of furniture made from sawdust and glue that has a wood veneer on the outside, but just sawdust on the inside. If it looks like mahogany on the outside, it ought to be mahogany all the way through. And it says to us as Christians, if we look like a Christ follower on the outside, we ought to be a Christ follower all the way through. And how we live our lives when no one's looking, that's to be a person of integrity. Verse 10 of our text says, For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced because they're turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching, and they do it only for money. You see, we're called to speak God's truth, not just our own opinions. And you're accountable for what you say and do. You're accountable for what you say and do. These are the hallmarks of integrity. So we are drowning in opinions. And I'm trying my best as your pastor to help you to know that I have deeply felt political opinions. And so do you. But I would rather preach the Word of God than political opinions from this pulpit. Amen. And I would rather guide you and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth as you open the Word for yourselves. Amen. So we speak the truth, not just our own opinions, and to know that we're accountable for what we say and do. James says that those of us who teach will be judged more strictly. That kind of makes me pause. And Jesus said to all of us that we must give account for every word that proceeds out of our mouths. 
We have to give account to God for what we say. And the third hallmark is that your life shows authenticity that people say of you, you're the real deal. The real deal. So let me wrap up this message by giving you a spiritual challenge. How do we apply this message? Well, the first thing that we're challenged to do is to live with a pure heart. And that purity comes from keeping our mind and conscience undefiled. How do you entertain yourself? What do you read? You've heard my old mantra. How about in the morning, his book before Facebook? How about demonstrating authenticity by the way I live? So what's God talking to you about right now as I bring this message? What, what part of your life isn't pure? You know there's pollution in your spirit. How has the enemy worked to defile your mind and your conscience? In what ways are you not being authentic? These are spiritual concerns, and they have a spiritual answer. In a moment, we're going to pray together. But first, I want you to consider with me the closing verses of this chapter 1. Listen to these words. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure. Nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny Him by the way they live. They're detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. You may feel as I do, how can I know that I measure up? And that's where grace comes in. Grace of God, which we'll celebrate in just a moment at the Lord's table. Grace and forgiveness draws us to our master who said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we cannot live God-pleasing lives by our own will, by our own confidence. We can only live God-pleasing lives by being connected to Jesus, which we will do this morning at the Lord's table. But bow your head and let me pray for you right now as we prepare our hearts. Our Father, we really want to believe right, and we want to live right, and we want to do the right things. And we live in a world that is so confused, that is pulling at us in so many different directions. We need your Spirit to minister to every one of us today. Lord, will you draw us unto yourself? There may be people who have heard this message and are feeling some conviction by the Holy Spirit that you're working with them as an individual, and I'm asking, Heavenly Father, that you'll minister to that person right now with grace and forgiveness and compassion. And I pray, Father, that as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table, that we will celebrate the grace that comes as one who gave his life as the payment for the penalty of our sins. We pray it all in Jesus' name, and together we say, Amen.